On this episode of Urban U, we document a post-pandemic spike in the number of applicants to our Master of Fine Arts programs. We talk to an expert from the CUNY School of Public Health about her research on the gut-brain connection. And tickle your senses with visual art from Queens College Museum, known as the Little Met. And the sound of this year's Color of Music Festival at the Grad Center. That and more CUNY stories and voices. Welcome to Urban U. When COVID-19 first brought the world to a halt, Abike Amedi began to question her professional path. I did my undergrad about like 10 or 12 years ago at Stony Brook University, and I majored in English, but once I graduated, I kind of never really did anything with my degree. I was never really fully happy in the corporate world, and once the pandemic hit and we were trapped inside, I started writing again, and it hadn't been years since I had really written. She also applied to the City College of New York's MFA program in creative writing on a whim. And she wasn't alone, says Michelle Valadares, the program's director. Since I've been the program director, our numbers were steadily um, rising. They got to maybe 80 or 90. But during the pandemic, they spiked. In 2020, that cohort, we had 145 students. And that was our highest number. Call it a phenomenon rather than a fluke. Because for a third straight year, college and university enrollment across the country dipped with the undergraduate count 7% lower than it was in fall 2019. And yet the number of applicants at CUNY's creative writing programs at Hunter College, Brooklyn College, and Queens College kept a steady flow of students. CCNY's program was in such high demand, it had to modify its admissions process. And it hasn't really gone down. In fact, our admissions is so big that we've actually shut, we had two admission periods and now we only have one admission period. It's become slightly more competitive to get into our program because a lot more writers that would maybe go to other schools are saying yes to us still. So what's caused this stir among aspiring writers? Possibly the accolades won by contemporary authors out of CUNY's MFA programs, like Phil Clay, a Hunter College graduate whose debut novel, Missionaries, landed on former President Barack Obama's 2020 list of favorite books. Caitlin Greenwich, a Hunter College MFA alum, a Guggenheim Fellow, and the author of the acclaimed novel, Liberty. And New York Times bestselling author, Brendan Kiley, a 2011 CCNY alumnus. Valadares also attributes the demand at CCNY in particular to CUNY's affordable tuition and the quality of the program. So it's openness in terms of background, um, culture, uh, but also we're very open about what you're going to study here. So for example, we're not genre snobs. Such openness has helped Abike Amedi expand her goals as a writer, author, and creative. I do want to write fiction, but after taking a class here called The Evidence of Things Unseen, Art Archives in Harlem, and I learned that you can channel so much of writing through archival work. Um, one thing that really connected me to it is I learned that Langston Hughes had traveled to um, Soviet Central Asia in the early 1930s, which is where my family migrated from, Uzbekistan, and he was actually in that country right around the time my great-grandparents were leaving. And so little is documented um, with the Central Asian diaspora, so that blew my mind. And now I'm actually working on my own side projects into trying to preserve archives of my community, of the Central Asian diaspora, and I would love to be able to channel that into so many different mediums, not just books. I really believe that the arts have a direct connection to people's real passions, their real voices. And we're living in a moment in time where we are told by the media and by the loud voices in the culture what we should be thinking. And I'm an optimist. I think deep inside we have um, something to express, and I believe that it's something beautiful. Abby Ashola for Urban U.
Since 1997, CUNY Citizenship Now has paved the way for thousands of immigrants and new Americans to get their U.S. citizenship, and we are thrilled to celebrate its 25th anniversary this year. As the largest university legal assistance program in the nation, we know that immigrants make our city and our country a better place by boosting local businesses and making our communities more vibrant. Thanks to hundreds of attorneys, paralegals, staff, and volunteers, the impact of CUNY Citizenship Now in improving our nation is immeasurable. Join me in saying happy 25 years. Muchas felicidades en estos primeros 25 años y que sean muchos, muchos más. You know how people say, listen to your gut and you are what you eat? Well, those sayings may be truer than we thought. Since 2004, scientists have been studying what's called the gut-brain axis, a two-way biochemical signaling that takes place between the GI tract and the central nervous system that can affect cognition, personality, and mood. CUNY PhD, Dr. Laura Castleman fills us in. For example, you're doing an interview and you're feeling really nervous and you, uh, so your stomach starts to hurt a little bit or you get butterflies in your stomach. So that's your brain and your gut talking to each other in both directions. The primary pathway for this conversation is what scientists have identified as the vagus nerve, where neurons are sent back and forth eliciting chemical responses in the microbiome and the brain. Researchers are now studying what effects these conversations have and if external influences can alter their outcomes. There are a lot of different ways that your gut can affect your brain, but scientists have found that your gut can affect things like how you learn, how you remember things, um, if you feel anxious or if you feel depressed. Even some scientists have found evidence that your gut can impact your personality. Everybody has a gut microbiome and all Everybody has an influence of their gut microbiome on their brain. However, uh, as many people know, humans are so diverse and there are many different uh, factors that influence how the gut influences people's brain, including age, gender, where a person lives, what ethnicity a person is, there are a lot of different factors. I think one of the most important things about learning about the gut-brain connection is that one of the major influencers is diet. I'm working on large population level studies to see you know when people report what they eat and then people also report how they feel or how they uh, think or how they learn or their memory um, is there a relationship do they show that they have better memory or they feel less depressed or they have feel less anxiety dr castleman says that making your diet more bacteria friendly with fermented foods and fruits and vegetables has been shown to have a beneficial effect on the emotional and cognitive centers of the brain in most people what would you say to people who are saying you're telling them to eat their spinach, literally? I think it's really about a balance between uh, eating junk food and eating healthy food. So, for example, if you eat a hamburger and fries with a milkshake one night, maybe the next night, instead of eating something similar or maybe pizza and ice cream, maybe think about eating a really nice bowl of brown rice with beans and a side of broccoli or whatever type of fiberful food that you prefer because then the gut microbes that you kind of starved the night before with your hamburgers are gonna be really happy eating these fiberful foods the next day. So do you think one day we might not need to have prescriptions for things like depression and anxiety? We may just be telling people, if you eat this type of food, it will lessen. I think that would be a wonderful aspirational goal to get to. I don't think we're there yet. But I think that um, in the right context, absolutely a doctor could prescribe a diet change leading to eating things that have more fiber and that may in the end help the person to feel less depressed and maybe potentially they wouldn't need to use antidepressants anymore. But at this point, I don't think we're there yet. And while there's still a lot more work to be done in the areas of sample size and population cofactors, as well as more testing with human subjects, the results have been encouraging. I think the gut-brain axis is really the next frontier. Um, it's really a fascinating connection just to think that your gut is talking to your brain and your brain is talking to your gut, and things that you eat can influence how you think, how you feel. Um, so whatever you can do to protect your gut health, 
I would say, let's do it. It's very accessible. We don't need prescriptions to do it. Anybody can go to the store and find apples and broccoli, and hopefully your gut will respond well, and then maybe your brain will respond well. I'm Scott Kirby for Urban U. My area of research commonly looks at behaviors related to technology use. For the past few years, I've been working on projects looking at how people might develop negative behaviors with regard to technology use. So the area that's also known as the dark side of technology use. And we wanted to see how a normal social media use might turn into a compulsion or sometimes even an addiction. It's not solely technology that's at fault, and it's also not just the individual that's at fault, but it's more like the relationship between individual and technology that becomes problematic. In certain individual needs that we might have, let's say, need for entertainment, need for information, or some people might have need for validation. And then social media being a platform that give you the opportunity to basically fulfill those needs, this relationship over time can become some sort of a compulsion or it might lead to addiction. The, the effect in the brain is very similar to using a substance to some extent. So when people use substance, they have an experience of a dopamine release. And similar effects have been observed from our studies looking at uh, social media addiction. So we kind of, every time we insist, we see a notification or we see somebody liking our picture, we do see that effect of a dopamine release. Uh, when I was younger, I tend to play a lot of video games and that was always an issue for me. I stay up all night to play video games with my friends and when I went back to graduate school, then an opportunity came where my advisor was applying for a grant related to addiction and um, that's where we was able to like make this connection between a general type of addiction and um, addiction to technologies that have some pleasure producing aspect to them. The argument is I'm not saying that social media is bad by itself, I'm saying that it has a dark side that needs to be addressed so we can enjoy the positive aspects, increase in communication, social interaction, entertainment, we all need that, but again, to what extent? Still up on Urban U, the Little Met, right here at one of our CUNY schools. But first, more on the history behind our school's names. When a school is named Washington, everyone knows who that's named for. But not every institution is named for a household name, of course. So this week, we continue our look at the stories behind the names of our CUNY schools. This week, we wrap up Manhattan with a tour of our community colleges and graduate schools there. Some school names are rather self-explanatory, like the origin of Borough of Manhattan Community College. But Manhattan's other community college certainly has a story. Gutman Community College opened in 2012 as the new community college, but was renamed to Gutman the following year after receiving a $15 million endowment from the Stella and Charles Gutman Foundation. Charles Gutman was born to an immigrant family in Manhattan in 1892 and became a successful entrepreneur, particularly as a wine and liquor importer. Inspired in part by the challenges of his own upbringing on the turn of the century Lower East Side, Charles and his wife Stella founded the Gutman Foundation in 1959 which, among other philanthropic goals, aimed to help students' education. Upon their deaths in 1969, the Gutmans left their wealth to the foundation, and its donation to the community college stands as one of the largest ever to a two-year institution. Moving on to graduate schools, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies doesn't jump out as a name with a backstory, but this graduate school was born out of the Joseph S. Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies. Originally established at Queens College in 1984, a school for labor and urban studies became a standalone institution in 2018. Joseph S. Murphy himself was a lifelong educator and political scientist. He was president of Queens College and Bennington College in Vermont 
before becoming the fourth chancellor of CUNY from 1982 to 1990. Murphy would sadly die in a car crash in 1998, but he'd be remembered as a staunch advocate for the cause of the institution that bore his name, eulogized in the New York Times for his ability to combine a practical knowledge of politics with an enduring commitment to the poor and the working class. Lastly, we have the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism. The Craig of the Graduate School is the same Craig of Craigslist. Yep, the guy behind the website you got that toaster for your new apartment is the same guy behind the namesake of the only public graduate school of journalism in the Northeast. Since the website's launch in 1996, Craigslist has grown to currently the 25th most visited website in the country. Newmark himself was an inaugural inductee into the Internet Hall of Fame in 2012. And with his Craigslist fortune at his discretion, Craig Newmark has had a long history of philanthropy, from cybersecurity to veterans affairs to the environment, serving on the board of over 10 nonprofits. A particular focus has been journalism. I'm okay seeing news that I disagree with if the news has been fact-checked and the news... Not only serving on the board of the School of Journalism, but donating $20 million to the program. As such, the name of the school was changed in 2018. And with that, we close out Manhattan. Come back next month for more CUNY schools and more stories behind their names. For the record, I'm Ari Goldberg. The story of the Odwin Turnback Museum is tied to the history of New York City's art world. The foundation of the museum, it's actually a man and a woman. It's Frances Godwin, who was a beloved art historian. She was a medievalist, that was her field. She worked here for 25 years at Queens College. She was introduced to Joseph Turnback, who was a world-renowned conservator. In 1957, they were introduced by Turnbach's daughter, who was studying with Francis Godwin. And in 57, they collaborated on this idea of creating a world-class art collection that would be a teaching museum. Francis Godwin and Joseph Turnbach joined forces, and they were able to attract donors who had donated to the Metropolitan Museum of Art of New York City. So the Linsky Gallery, at, or the wing at the Met, that was endowed by the Linsky family, we have about 12 marvelous pieces from the Linskys in our collection. That collection grew from 1957, and in 1981, the museum was chartered and became a, an institution within the college, a legitimate institution. The collection is open to students, faculty, and staff to do research, and in many cases, to handle art objects. When I bring my students here to the museum, I bring it as, as a capstone moment. So it's at the end of the semester that we arrive, and curators set up tables with artifacts related to the course. So they are encouraged, actually, they've been encouraged to touch and handle the materials because it's a teaching collection. And I think, as ordinary as that sounds, right, it sounds like a very mundane thing, but it's a very extraordinary engagement with artifacts that are often a thousand years old or more. For me, it's enchanting to see just how disarmed they are by proximity to the past. The museum offers all types of educational programming, including artist talks, curator talks, gallery conversations, family workshops, and kindergarten through 12th grade school visits. 
As a museum education intern at the Godwin Turnbach Museum, I was in charge of developing an education guide for K-12 students, educators, and caregivers. And so a primary goal of the guide was really to teach students or create a tool for educators and caregivers to be able to go over certain topics within art, within the classroom, maybe even at home, right? And this guide was meant to be um, a public-facing, online guide. I admit that I find this space very inspiring, actually, and very relaxing at the same time. So it does have a bit of a cathedral quality for me. And I think in such a busy city and, and in, with such a harried schedule, um, it is, a, you know, it is certainly a blessing to have a space like this. Not many people know that we exist. And I think, you know, creating awareness that we are here, we're open to students, faculty, staff, but also the public to come and visit, to view our exhibitions, to attend our programs. Most of our exhibitions, if not all, are in, and programs are free of charge. So it's really a great opportunity for anyone that's in the area, or if you want to take a bus ride, a train ride, come and visit us. Once you get here, your visit is free. So don't forget, CUNY invites all comers to visit the Godwin Turnback Museum at Queens College, known proudly as the Little Met. I'm Elena Romero for Urban U. My name is Nissan Ak. I'm studying orchestral conducting, master's degree in Queens College, and I want to be a conductor. I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. I want to combine traditional and modern music in a certain way that both audience and the players and me as a conductor will love it. I want to conduct in Carnegie Hall. As a woman conductor, we have a really few role models because it's a male dominant job and both the conductors and the players, they don't know what, how to react, actually. <laughs> Some of the people overcome it by starting acting masculine. I, I don't do that, I'm not masculine at all. I'm very modern and feminine, and I want to be a conductor. Maybe I'll be that role model for next generation. I remember growing up and listening to Yo-Yo Ma and listening to Steven Isserlis and listening to Rostropovich and listening to Janusz Starker, um, all these different, you know, wonderful, wonderful cellists, but I never saw anyone that looked like me. Seeing black musicians perform the works of black composers like Chevalier St. George, Jose White, Collard Taylor, and Valerie Coleman is exactly what the Color of Music Festival set out to do when it was created back in 2012 in South Carolina. If you think about how many people you have seen on a classical channel that look like me, you probably have to start really thinking deeply. And so our mission is to have those opportunities for this type of talent to be on stage. Cellist Kenneth Wall agrees. It's so important to realize that excellence in composition, the excellence in singing, the excellence in instrumental playing has always been there in our community. And um, it's, it's very important to emphasize it and to bring it to the forefront. Celebrating the contributions of black composers by having black musicians perform their works is representation at its finest and a way to foster change, opportunity, and diversity in the world of classical music. The opportunity to be part of Color of Music is enormous because you can be a role model, you can maybe change somebody's day and let them know, yes, you can and you belong. It is important to show everyone that classical music belongs to everyone in a way. Rameau Grimbert Barre, a violinist from the Color of Music Festival, is part of an octet of acclaimed classical musicians of African descent who perform a diverse classical repertoire nationwide. The quality of their playing is on par, if not greater than, their contemporaries. 
but they do not get the opportunities as much as their contemporaries. Diversifying other classical arts like theater or the ballet will hopefully be on the horizon as well. But in the meantime, the Color Music Festival is reaching young people by visiting public schools and fostering an interest in classical music to kids of all backgrounds. Excellence is excellence, no matter what, no matter what color. It's important, yeah, through the Color of Music to promote black classical musicians and black classical composers. So I think it's an amazing way, yeah, to make it more universal. For Urban U, I'm Tina Beth Pena. For more episode highlights and sneak peeks into our upcoming stories, meet us on our social media platforms. Thank you for watching these stories from the nation's largest urban university, the City University of New York. Thank you.